Welcome back to Biomechanics. We've now seen that bone is a hard connective tissue that forms the rigid skeleton. Its yield strain is less than 1%. Its elastic modulus is high compared with most other tissues. The elastic modulus of compact human long bone is approximately 18 gigapascals. The stress strain relationship is linear within the elastic range and it does depend on strain rate, but this dependence is minor. For these reasons, bone is frequently and well approximated as a linear Hookean elastic material. Bone is also anisotropic. It's a composite of mineral matrix and collagen fibers. It has an organized microstructure. In some places, it's lamella or layered. Mostly in long bone, it's haversion or tubular. And at the ends of the bone and on the endosteum, it's trabecular or spongy. The elastic moduli of bone vary with the type of loading between tension and compression, bending and shear. And the elastic moduli vary with the orientation of the sample from within the bone. For example, transverse versus axial versus circumferential tensile and compression testing give different elastic moduli. In other words, bone is said to be anisotropic. It requires, therefore, more than two elastic constants to describe it as a linearly elastic material. One convenient way to visualize the mechanical properties of linearly elastic materials is to use the stiffness matrix C. We can do this if we represent the stress and strain tensors as column matrices. So the matrix sigma has as its components the six different components of the stress tensor. And the matrix E has its components, the six different components of the strain tensor. Notice that the shear strains are actually have a two in front of them. We can therefore write a linear relationship between the stress components and the strain components using a six by six matrix and this is called the stiffness matrix. For example, for the isotropic Hookean elastic material that we've already seen, the stiffness matrix looks like this. On the diagonals, we see lambda plus two mu for the first three terms, for the normal terms, and the only terms for the shear stresses are mu on the diagonal, because for the shear components, Tij equals two mu epsilon ij. So this is just a shorthand way of representing the fourth order tensor of elastic constants in a two-dimensional matrix that's easier to visualize and work with. So in other words, if we wanted to write a computer program that computed the stresses as a function of the strain, this might be a convenient way to do it rather than to represent the elastic coefficients in a three by three by three by three uh, matrix of components of the elasticity tensor. But it contains all the same information, so it can be a helpful way of looking at the stress-strain relation. We can also look at the inverse relationship between the strain and the stress, which is given by the compliance matrix. So the inverse of the stress-strain relation is the strain-stress relation, in which the strain is equal to the compliance matrix times the stress. If the stress-strain relationship is linear, it must be invertible, and therefore we must be able to find the compliance matrix S, which is also a six by six matrix. And again, for an isotropic Hookean elastic solid, written this time in terms of the technical constants E and nu, instead of the LMA constants lambda and mu, we get this. So it makes sense that the reciprocal of the Young's modulus and the reciprocal of the shear modulus appears in the compliance matrix, which is the inverse of the stiffness matrix. So this is a convenient way to write the strain as a function of stress for an isotropic Hookean elastic solid. Orthotropy is a more complex type of material symmetry, and bone is often assumed to be orthotropic. Orthotropic materials have different properties along three mutually perpendicular axes, meaning that they have three Young's moduli and three shear moduli and three independent Poisson ratios for a total of nine 
technical constants. These can be determined from three uniaxial tests from which you get the three Young's moduli and the three Poisson ratios and three plane shear tests in three mutually perpendicular planes which give us the three shear moduli. The three mutually perpendicular structural axes of orthotropic symmetry are defined by the microstructure of the bone and are usually taken to be the radial axis, the circumferential axis and the longitudinal axis. As in the case for isotropic materials, the stiffness matrix again has 12 non-zero components in the same places, but now instead of those being determined from just two independent constants, uh, they're determined by nine different numbers. So again, the structure of the stiffness matrix for orthotropic materials has this block here in the top left-hand corner relating the normal stresses to the normal strains and just diagonal terms relating the shear stresses to the shear strains. The technical constants are the three Young's moduli for uniaxial strain along each of the three axes, so E1, E2 and E3. There are actually six Poisson ratios, nu ij, for strain epsilon jj when the material is loaded in the xi direction. That's because in an orthotropic material, when we strain it in the xi direction, it will strain differently, it will contract differently in the two mutually perpendicular directions. So in each uniaxial test, we'd actually measure two Poisson ratios, giving a total of six. However, it can be shown that these six numbers are related to each other via the three different Young's moduli so that we can write nu i j e j is equal to nu j i e i. Uh, no summation is implied in this particular identity. So this just says, for example, that nu 1 2 e 2 is equal to nu 2 1 e 1. So even though we will measure six Poisson ratios, in fact, only three of them are independent of each other. And then finally, we have three shear moduli uh, for the three planes. So we have uh, G12, which is equal to G21, G13, which is equal to G31, and G23, which is equal to G32, for shear in the 1, 2, 1, 3, and 2, 3 planes, respectively. So here's the compliance matrix for an orthotropic linearly elastic solid. And you can see that it has a similar structure and appearance to the compliance matrix for the isotropic hook in elastic solid, except that the Young's moduli are different in each row for the three different axes, and the shear moduli are different in each of rows three, four, and five for the three different planes. And the different Poisson ratios that we discussed appear in the off diagonals of the top left block. So in total, there are nine numbers needed to create the compliance matrix or stiffness matrix for an orthotropic solid material. Now transverse isotropy is a simpler case than orthotropy in which two of the Young's moduli are similar to each other compared with the third. And similarly, the Poisson ratios in two planes are similar to each other compared with the Poisson ratio in the other plane. In the case of bone, this means that there are actually greater differences between the axial and transverse directions, namely the axial and radial direction or the axial and circumferential direction, than there are between the radial and circumferential direction. So in other words, for bone, the biggest difference is between E3, if E3 represents the Young's modulus along the bone axis, than between E1 and E2, if they represent the Young's moduli in the radial and circumferential directions, and similarly for the Poisson ratios. So transversely isotropic materials are simplified in that they have one preferred axis, it's often referred to as the fiber axis of the material, and in the case of bone, this preferred axis is the long axis of the bone. In long bones, the fibers that form this structural axis and that give rise to this transverse isotropy are the osteons. And we assume then that in the plane transverse to these fibers, the properties of the material are isotropic. So the properties are different along the fibers, but perpendicular to the fibers, uh, there's no difference. Consequently, the stiffness matrix for orthotropy simplifies from nine independent constants to five. 
that represent the Young's modulus in the transverse plane. So in other words, the Young's modulus in both the radial and circumferential directions. The Young's modulus in the fiber direction or the long axis of the bone. Two Poisson ratios, um, a transverse and a fiber Poisson ratio and one shear modulus. And in terms of the stiffness matrix that we wrote for orthotropy, this amounts to setting C11 equal to C22, C13 equal to C23, C44 equal to C55, and C66 equaling 0.5 of C11 minus C12. And hence we end up with E1 and E2 from the orthotropic material law being equal to ET, the transverse, Young's modulus for a transversely isotropic material, and E3 for the orthotropic law equaling EF, the fiber Young's modulus. Nu31 and Nu32 from the orthotropic model both equal Nu F in the transversely isotropic model, and Nu13 and Nu23 equal Nu F times the ratio of the transverse to the fiber Young's moduli. Nu12 and Nu21 in the orthotropic model become Nu T, the transverse plane Poisson ratio. The shear moduli G31 and G32 become GF, the shear modulus for planes involving the fiber axis. And the shear modulus in the transverse plane G12 comes from the Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio in the transverse plane in the same way that it does for isotropic materials. So here are some measurements of the orthotropic technical constants for long bone, femur, or tibia, measured two ways, either by mechanical testing or by ultrasonic testing. The last two columns show the fully orthotropic material parameters, and the first two columns show the simplification for transverse isotropy. Here you can see that E1 and E2 are the same in the first two columns, and G13 and G23 are the same. These are the constraints and simplifications of transverse isotropy. So the important thing to notice is that the differences between the first and second directions, which are the radial and circumferential direction, in the orthotropic data, regardless of whether they're measured by ultrasound or mechanical methods, are much smaller than their difference with the long axis measurement. So here we have seven or eight gigapascals for the radial and circumferential directions, which are much closer to each other than 18 for the long axis. And here we have 12 or 13 gigapascals measured by ultrasound for the, for the transverse directions, which are pretty close to each other compared with 20 for the axial values. And similarly, you can look at some of these other numbers and see that the Poisson ratio, for example, is much different for um, the 1-2 plane than it is for the 1-3 and 2-3 planes. Consequently, the assumption of transverse isotropy for human long bone is not a bad one insofar as the orthotropic properties are pretty close to transversely isotropic. On the other hand, we see that the Young's modulus for the axial direction is much higher than the Young's modulus in the transverse planes. So transverse isotropy is a much better approximation of bone mechanical properties than isotropy is. So to summarize the key points on bone mechanics that we've discussed so far, we've seen that under physiological loads, bone can be assumed to be hooky and elastic with a high elastic modulus compared with other tissues. The microstructure of the bone composite makes the material response anisotropic. Compared with an isotropic hooky and elastic solid, which has two independent technical constants, transversely isotropic linearly elastic solids have five independent elastic constants, and orthotropic hooky and elastic solids have nine. For human cortical bone, orthotropy is a somewhat better approximation than transverse isotropy, but transverse isotropy is a much better approximation than isotropy. Now we will formulate and solve a problem using the static equilibrium of an isotropic hooky and elastic solid. Collectively, the governing equations for this class of problem are known as the linear elastostatics equations. They include the equilibrium equations for a continuum, the divergence of the stress tensor plus the density times body forces is equal to zero, or an index notation, del Tij del Xi plus rho Bj is equal to zero. The constitutive law for stress in an isotropic hooky and elastic solid that says that the Cauchy stress T is equal to lambda times the trace of the Cauchy strain epsilon 
times i, the identity tensor, plus 2 mu times epsilon. Or an index notation, tij equals lambda epsilon kk delta ij plus 2 mu epsilon ij. And finally, the kinematic relations, which are the strain displacement relationship that we need because we want to formulate the problem in terms of unknown displacements u. So in direct notation, the Cauchy strain is equal to one half of the gradient of u plus the transpose of the gradient of u. Or in index notation, epsilon ij equals one half del ui del xj plus del uj del xi. So with these equations of linear elastostatics, we have everything we need to solve a boundary value problem for an isotropic Hookean elastic solid in static equilibrium. And the problem that we will solve today is the problem of the simple axial torsion of an isotropic linearly elastic cylindrical rod. In this problem, the radius of every point remains the same. The cross-sectional planes remain planes and don't displace up or down in the z direction. And each cross-sectional plane rotates with the angle of rotation increasing in proportion to z. The strains, therefore, are the same in every cross-sectional plane, and the displacements can be written most conveniently in cylindrical polar coordinates as follows. The radial component of the displacement is zero, so points move neither inwards nor outwards. The z component of the displacement is zero, points move neither up or down. The only displacement is in the circumferential direction, theta, and that is proportional to the z coordinate by a constant of proportionality alpha, that is the twist per unit length of the cylinder. Although it's easier for us to prescribe the displacements of this problem in polar coordinates, it's easier for us to solve for the stresses and strains using Cartesian coordinates. So the next step is to convert these displacements in cylindrical polar coordinates to displacements in rectangular Cartesian coordinates. And to do that, we make use of the polar to Cartesian coordinate transformations given by x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, and z equals z. So this is a familiar transformation between polar and Cartesian coordinates. Now, if we note that an increment of length in the circumferential direction is r d theta, then we can convert the angular displacement u theta, which must be small for infinitesimal strains, into a Cartesian displacement r times u theta. Then taking the x and y components of r u theta, we would get that the x component is minus r u theta sine theta, because notice that this is a displacement in the minus x direction, and the y component is r u theta cosine theta. Now we can use the polar to Cartesian coordinate conversion above to convert r sine theta into y and r cosine theta into x and substitute for u theta equal to alpha z to give us the displacements in Cartesian coordinates as ux equals minus alpha zy, uy equals alpha zx, and uz equals zero. Now that we have the displacements everywhere in the body, we can derive the strains. From the strain displacement relation, the strain components are epsilon xx equals zero, epsilon yy equals zero, and epsilon zz equals zero for the normal components. And for the shear components, epsilon xy is one half del ux del y, which is minus alpha z, plus del uy del x, which is plus alpha z, which equals zero. However, epsilon xz, which is one half del ux del z plus del uz del x, is equal to one half of minus alpha y, and epsilon yz, which is one half del uy del z plus del uz del y, equals one half of alpha x. So we have two non-zero strains that are shear strains in the plane containing the z-axis. Substituting these strains into the constitutive law for the isotropic Hookean elastic material, we get that the normal strains 
TXX, TYY, and TZZ are zero, as well as TXY, since epsilon XY is zero, leaving us only two non-zero stresses, TXZ, which is minus mu alpha Y, and mu is G, the shear modulus, and TYZ, which is G alpha X, directly proportional to the corresponding shear strain components. Now we can plug the stresses into the equilibrium equations. In the absence of body forces, they read del Txx del x plus del Txy del y plus del Txz del z for the first equation. And this will give us 0 plus 0 plus del del z of minus g alpha y, which is also 0, is equal to 0. So the first equilibrium equation is satisfied. Next. The second equilibrium equation is del Tyx del x plus del Tyy del y plus del Tyz del z is equal to zero. And again, we get zero plus zero plus del del z of g alpha x, which again is equal to zero. So the second equilibrium equation is satisfied. And finally, the third equilibrium equation, del Tzx del x plus del Tzy del y plus del Tzz del z, gives us del del x of g alpha y, which is 0, plus del del y of g alpha x, which is 0, plus 0 is equal to 0. So all three equilibrium equations for this particular stress state derived for an isotropic hook and elastic solid for simple torsional shear about the long axis of a cylinder are automatically satisfied for the body in equilibrium with no body forces. Now we also need to consider the boundary conditions. We assume that the tractions are applied to the ends of the rod to cause it to twist. So these can be computed from the stress solution. But in the case of the curved surface of the rod, there should be no tractions on that boundary. So we need to verify that this stress solution not only satisfies equilibrium, but it also satisfies that traction-free boundary condition on the curved surface of the rod. So Cauchy's formula Ti equals Nj Tij relates the tractions to the stress components. So we have the stress components, so we just need to know what the outward normal is. So the outward normal on the boundary at R equals A on the surface of the rod will have X components X divided by A and Y component Y divided by A and a Z component of zero because the outward normal to a cylinder will be perpendicular to the Z axis. And so we can now use these components along with the previously computed stress components to confirm that the tractions acting on the surface are zero. So looking at the first traction, Txx nx plus Txy ny plus Txz nz, we find that x times Txx plus y times Txy is in fact just zero plus zero equals zero. And similarly, Tyx nx plus Tyy ny plus Tyz nz should equal zero. And again, we can easily confirm that x times Tyx plus y times Tyy equals zero. So again, um, the no traction condition on the curved surface is satisfied for the second traction. And finally, for the third component, we get Tzx times nx plus T zy ny plus tzz nz should equal zero and this simplifies to x times tzx plus y times tzy is equal to zero and that gives us minus x times g alpha y plus y times g alpha x which cancel each other and equal zero so what this shows is that the stresses that we computed from the strains that we obtained from the displacements prescribed for a simple torsion of our isotropic hooking elastic shaft do satisfy equilibrium and they satisfy equilibrium such that the tractions acting on the curved free surface of the cylinder will be zero. So the prescribed displacements can be achieved merely by applying tractions to the ends of the cylinder, which we can compute at the end by integrating the stress solutions across the cross section. To obtain the resultant forces and moments required to produce the displacements that we've prescribed and the stresses that we've derived, we integrate the stresses over the cross-section of the rod. Integrating the stresses over the cross-section shows that all the force resultants go to zero. Integrating the shear stresses times their corresponding moment arms 
across the cross section of the rod, we get the resultant torsional moment M, where M is the double integral of the moment arm associated with TYZ, which is X, minus the moment arm associated with TZX, which is Y. Notice these moments are in opposite directions, and hence the minus sign, and the resultant moment in this view will be positive about a z-axis pointing out of the page. So this double integral gives us the resultant torsional moment. Now substituting for tyz and txz, we get g alpha x squared plus g alpha y squared. g and alpha are constants, so we take them out of our integration, and we get g alpha times the double integral of x squared plus y squared dx dy. Now, we recognize that x squared plus y squared is r squared, and so we can perform this integration in polar coordinates for simplicity, and then this becomes the integral of r squared with respect to r dr d theta, integrating across a cross-section from 0 to 2 pi and 0 to a, which is the radius. So that then gives us 2 pi g alpha over 4 times the integral of r cubed from 0 to a, which is a to the fourth over 4. And this simplifies to pi g a to the fourth alpha over 2. So this integral here, which gives us a to the fourth over 4, is known as the polar moment of inertia. So the moment is a combination of the shear modulus g, the polar moment of inertia j, and together their product is known as the torsional rigidity. So given a twist per unit length alpha, in general we can say that the torsional moment m is equal to g times j times alpha, where g is the shear modulus, j is the polar moment of inertia, gj is the torsional rigidity, and alpha is the twist per unit length. And this result turns out to be true for the simple torsion of any isotropic Hookean elastic bar of constant cross-section, where the only difference due to a different cross-section is the polar moment of inertia, j. So in summary, the key points we've seen in our derivation of the solution for torsion of a Hookean elastic shaft is that for an isotropic homogeneous Hookean elastic shaft of uniform cross-section, the torsional moment m is proportional to the shear modulus g the polar moment of inertia j, and the twist per unit length alpha. We compute m by integrating the shear stresses times their corresponding moment arm over the cross-section of the shaft. For a circular shaft, j is proportional to the fourth power of the radius. The product gj is called the torsional rigidity. And this solution is only valid for isotropic linearly elastic solids undergoing infinitesimal strains. In other words, when alpha is a small angular gradient, so that R alpha is less, for example, than 0.01.